Let's stand together, going to Esther chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read a passage of Scripture tonight. I was talking with someone earlier. You know, Esther's a short book, and, uh, you know, you feel like if you've ever preached Esther, you've probably preached it before, because uh, you can pretty much cover the whole book in a message. Um, however, I'm going to go from a different standpoint, but the title may sound very familiar I don't know that I've ever done this, Brother AC, but I'm going to do a part two from 2013. I preached a message titled Virtue on Trial, but I, I did from Esther's standpoint. Now tonight I want to take you to another person in the story, and I'm going to preach Virtue on Trial, but it's from a different person in this story. And it's found in Esther chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bictha, Abaktha, Zether, and uh, Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. Tell your neighbor, say she was pretty. There ain't nothing wrong with that. The Bible says the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlain. Because she knew why he wanted her to come. And this made the king mad, the Bible says. And his anger burned within him. The king, then he asked his advisors in verse 15 what he should do. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she didn't do what I asked her to do. She has not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. I mean, he's making a big deal out of this. When really, it wasn't that big of a deal. He was kind of, his ego, I think, had kind of been deflated because he wanted her for her beauty, and that's why she knew he wanted her in the room that night. And so he's making this now, well, she's going to pay. And so in verse 16, Memekin answered, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and all the people that are in the provinces of the king of Hasris. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women. Boy, they are scared. They got a movement on their hands. And then he makes matters worse. He says, they're going to despise their husbands in their eyes. And when it shall be reported, the king has he, he commanded Vashti the queen to be brought before him, but she came not. When they hear the queen won't listen to the king, Boys, we're going to have problems at home. That's basically what they're saying. All right, so now, by the help of the Lord this evening, I'm going to talk to you just on the subject, virtue on trial. Virtue on trial. As I said, we all know Esther's virtue was on trial. But I want to talk to you about a lady that not very much is said about in Scripture. But I have to applaud her for doing what she did because she had her reasons. And those reasons were moral and they were very pure. Thank you, Brother Cannon, for singing about holiness tonight because I believe that the Lord still asks us to have virtue and still asks of us to be a certain way. And, uh, and actually, we are honoring our King by doing that. And so we're going to talk about that this evening. Lord Jesus, we ask God you would use this night together, the breaking of the Word of God, the breaking of the bread, so that we can understand your Word. I pray, Lord, that you would help us tonight timely fashion minister but minister effectively help us to leave with something lord in our heart tucked away that we can say that you spoke to us tonight encourage us build up your kingdom we pray in jesus name everybody say amen, amen. you can be seated tonight vashti quietly packed her meager belongings absent from her luggage was the costly cashmere robes i guess you would say and the silk garments that were typical of the median uh, royalty. Missing also were the pearls from the Persian Gulf and the crown jewels that shone brightly when the light would hit them. Her sandaled feet shuffled across the marbled floor as she slowly but with a resolute air assembled the remnants of her life from the past several years Keepsakes of little value to anyone but herself were carefully stowed to recall the years when she had lived and reigned as 
the premier Persian beauty of her day. Unconsciously, I would imagine she sighs. It was a disappointment that she was going to be banished from the kingdom. Vashti surveys the belongings laying randomly in a small heap at her feet. I can imagine where they would soon be taken to a new address outside of the palace walls and the clothes, the memories, the few personal effects lying before her represented her life, both what was spent of it and what was left. With dark, tearless eyes, she scanned her palace chambers, making certain that Nothing remained that was rightfully hers. She noticed her reflection in the mirror. It was tall. It was elegant. Even in the homespun dress of peasants, Vashti possessed a presence that awed even herself. She doubtlessly was qualified to be called Vashti. If you look up the word Vashti, it means the best. Or in modern Persia, it was translated as beautiful woman. She represented what was best and what was beautifully Uh, splendid in, in in a splendid place of Shushan. Vashti's gaze in the mirror, it may have went to a ribbon about an inch in width that ran about her forehead. It was violet in color. It was the sign of royalty worn only by those with access to the Persian throne. It was an emblem of what Vashti had been, but she was no longer. She could not step into the presence of King Ahasuerus, her former husband. He had divorced her. She was no longer the queen. Vashti noticed that her hands started to raise as if they had a will of their own. Intrigued, she stared as her long manicured fingers firmly grabbed this violet band and released its hold from her forehead. Now that's odd, she wondered. I don't feel any less a queen than before. The spell broke. The corners of her mouth slowly turned upward. And what was a sad day to begin with, I believe a smile would come across her face as she would turn and exit the palace. You see, her story is not complicated, but neither is it comforting. Because if Vashti was a Disney story tonight, they would have all lived happily ever after. If Vashti was a fairy tale, we, we could work the ending around a little differently. But you know what? Everything don't always end the way it does in, in uh, fantasy land and, and in reality, in real life. The, the message of Vashti's life is actually a testimony to the fact that right doesn't always seem to win in the present. You see, you can do what's right and still not get the pay raise on the job. You can report what is right and people still slap for it and tell you you shouldn't have done that so sometimes when you do what's right it doesn't seem like it's winning in the present world that good does not necessarily triumph in the short run and that speaking the truth today is actually kind of seldom welcomed you know if you ask somebody how they're doing a lot of times you don't really want to hear how they're doing uh you just was being nice you know somebody gets honest with you like well man can you believe what they just told me well you asked for you know the the truth reality is it's not really welcomed today as much Contrary also to these uh, romantic notions, this is a story of how wounded pride, uncontrolled through a temper, can cause irreparable damage to a relationship. King Ahasuerus was this proud husband, and surprisingly, he's the arch villain in the Vashti story. Through, uh, though Ahasuerus ruled the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire, his inability to rule his own passions resulted in his loss of the queen, the best treasure his life afforded him. Probably just prior to a major conquest, Ahasuerus invited the kingdom's princes and their wives to his palace in Shushan. And as was his custom, uh, King Ahasuerus presided over the men's feasting and uh, they were reveling while Queen Vashti was entertaining the women in separate quarters. Ahasuerus entertained the princes with a display of his wealth and, and a display of his might. For the Bible says, four entire months, the luxury of their surroundings led to a decline in their behavior. And so King and princes alike drank wine. And according to their pleasure, and the flesh's beastly nature gets unleashed in this atmosphere, And Ahasuerus was certain there remained something that he could wow them with, that he could parade in front of his princes. And only when he was full of wine did his imagination conceive what that something was. 
the king on a whim publicly commanded a servant to go and summon a lady by the name of Vashti, who was the queen, to appear before this drunken crowd. And there, as they would sit and they would stare, the queen was supposed to unveil herself. She was supposed to show her beauty. This would be a humiliating request to any Persian woman of her day, much less the queen. And so reminiscent of the proverb that wine is a mockery, Ahasuerus with his reasons clouded was playing the part of the fool in Proverbs. And while he is inflamed with wine, the same Noah who once had found grace with God while he was inflamed with wine, he shamed himself, the Bible says, before his entire family. And so I understand now why this story is taking the turn it is because now Ahasuerus is not acting like his normal self. And while he is grieving over, uh, if, you, if you go over to another story, you'll find where a man that's grieving over the loss of his wife and everything he owns. Brother Acey, I find where Lot gets filled with strong drink. He's trying to cope with this situation. And the Bible says uh, that uh, by his daughters, through this insectuous actions while he was drunk, he became the father of the Moabites and the Ammonites and two of Israel's most dreaded enemies in their future. And so the, there's a lot of history here between wine and making people do things that they wouldn't normally. Normally do. Uh, my mind goes to even Belshazzar, the, the Babylonian king. He's defeated by the Persians and he's down and he's out. And uh, he was drunk when he ordered the sacred vessels of Jehovah to be used in a toast to heathen gods. Wine always has the last laugh. And so Vashti's hurt when she hears the king Ahasuerus has commanded her to come in there and show off her beauty. Her husband's duty was to protect her, not to expose her. If she obeyed his unkingly command, she must cast aside her virtue. And she has to throw aside her self-respect. Now had she been a vain woman, folks, proud of her physical beauty, she might would have secretly rejoiced just in the, uh, in the opportunity. Whether she would have accepted it or not, if she would have been a vain woman, she would have took pride in that he felt the way he did. But she was not vain and she knew that even if she did go into this appearance, it would offend and it would provoke jealousy among the very women that she had entertained for the past four months. She couldn't hurt them. To do so would damage both herself and the king whom they served. Well, why do you bring all this up tonight? Because Vashti faced a difficult choice. Either she could act beneath her royal dignity and remain the queen, or she could act righteously and be dethroned. It was here that Vashti truly lived up to the meaning of her name. For she was at her best when she valued her virtue more than she valued her natural crown. What I'm here today to remind us of is this church. We need to value the virtue or the, more, the, the high moral standards and the holiness that God wants us to be and live as more than anything that the world would try to offer us. I'm going to tell you tonight, there is nothing more beautiful than one God apostolic people who say, I'm going to be holy as God is holy. I'm not going to fall into the trap that the devil would set for me and say that I have to lay down my morals and my values, that I have to sacrifice my virtue for anyone or anything. But I'm here to remind us tonight as we talked about Sunday night, our complete allegiance ought to be to the lover of our soul. I'm going to live for God. I'm not living for anything or anybody else. I'm going to, I'm going to value my virtue you and I'm telling you in our world today there are plenty of opportunities for you to let down on your virtue the enemy is setting traps he's trying to ensnare us Vashti valued her virtue more than she valued her crown 
And so she refused. I'm not going to comply with the king's drunken uh, stupor and his desires merely just to feed her own vanity. She said, I'm not going to do it. And she chose to be brave, whatever the consequences would be for that disobedience and how that that would be caused. She said, I'll face the consequence rather than, than, than to violate my conscience. And so she sent word to the king of her refusal. When the king received her message, the Bible talks about how his heart turned (coughs) from happiness to anger. He was humiliated in front of all his friends. I don't feel good. Shouldn't have made the request. His drunken advisors, then they counsel him. Oh, you got to divorce her. You got to take away the royal possessions for fear that her actions are going to now be made known to all the women and she be viewed as a hero. And so we find in the scriptures that Ahasuerus did as he was advised. Nobody spoke up in Vashti's defense or came to her rescue at the last minute. No one came and said, I'm sorry you're having to leave the palace, but I want to applaud you for doing what's right. Listen, if you got to have an applause or a pat on the back to do what's right, you're going to mess up plenty of times in your life because there's going to come times where you have to do it even when it's not popular. And she understood. No one could imagine a queen refusing to submit to her king. No matter how just and how inappropriate his demands, they couldn't imagine that. Vashti was scorned as unworthy of both her crown and her husband. You see, last minute miracles happen in fairy tales, but this is real life, and she was doing what was right. The king later regrets his actions, but and, and, and he would even admit such to Esther in the story. He would regret those actions, but the laws of the Medes and Persians would not allow his word to be altered. It's kind of like what Pilate said, what I have written... I have written. Ahasuerus sent a stunning young lady that he loved to exile. Vashti left the palace and her name likewise disappears from view in scripture. When she walks out those palace doors, you never read the name Vashti again. But I have to feel she was okay with that. I would rather hold on to my virtue than sacrifice it for a name. Because then, you know, what good is it if your name is still on the lips of everybody, but it's not in a favorable sense? Can you believe what the queen did? Can you believe? But, you know, she was kind of in a a no-win situation here. Although her absence became the opportunity for Esther, and and I'm not trying tonight to take away from the story of Esther. I'm thankful God promoted her and and did that for the sake of his people. And it it catapulted her into a very crucial position for the preservation of God's people. But I want to tell you tonight, that would not have even been possible had it not been for some honorable actions by a lady by the name of, of, of Vashti. And and we cannot forget what sacrifice she made. Her virtue had been placed on trial. She chose, I'm going to submit to the inward king of virtue. You see, Vashti's modesty, in fact, may have ensured Esther's selection. As is often the case, the woman sought after strongly resembled the woman who was lost. Esther possessed the same unwavering obedience to modesty and virtue as that was possessed by the displaced Vashti. And so on this Wednesday night I feel under unction of the Holy Ghost to remind us of the world in which we live in our virtue our holiness our way of living folks it is on trial in 2018 in ways that it has never been before and we are faced with the decision every day like Vashti had to make and I'm here this evening to encourage us we must keep obeying the word of God in regards to modesty and virtue Come on, don't allow the world and don't allow Hollywood to dictate how you act and how you dress and who you are. But let the Bible tell you how a child of God acts and how a child of God dresses and let the Bible inform you you are not a nobody but you are a part of royalty. Don't lay down the virtue. Don't lay down anything that would sacrifice for this world. We got to keep pushing toward the heavenly. Paul said everything behind me, it's behind me. I press toward the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Oh, take this whole world but give me Jesus take everything from me right now if it's going to cost me heaven I don't need it I don't need any 
anything that will cost me my soul. Well, there's just some things that's preacher religion. You know what? I'd rather abide by preacher religion and make it to heaven than to take a chance and me get to the pearly gates and him say, you know what? That preacher wasn't really, he wasn't really off. You know what? At that point, it's going to be a little too long. For, it's going to take a little too long for you to scrub that off. And it ain't going to be long enough for the hair to grow. Men, it ain't going to be long enough for us to get some of our attitude right and other things. Come on now. I need to stay holy. Well, that's impossible. No, he said, be ye holy, even as I also am holy. Church, we don't have to bow to the music the world's trying to play in our ears. Come on, the devil's singing a sad song. And he's trying to confuse the church and tell them, well, if you do all that, it's going under. No, friend, my Bible says that in the twinkling of an eye, the church is actually going to go up. I just got to make sure I'm a part of the church. But while I'm in this earth, my Bible says I got to live godly in this earth present world. I'm not going to sacrifice my virtue. I'm not going to let down on my modesty to accommodate some worldly desires. Now, I had a conversation with somebody not long ago and a statement that I make can, can be misunderstood. I am responsible for what comes on this platform and what comes off this platform. And Brother Acey, I'm responsible for what I preach across this pulpit. But God didn't call pastor to be spiritual police and come to your house and make sure you're living right. Come on, bro. Come on. And if that's what it takes, you're going to be lost, especially here. Yes. Amen. Because Lord knows we ain't got time for all that. But at some point, we got to get what we talked about Sunday night, a relationship with God. But somebody said, well, you said you're only responsible for your platform. Well, yeah, I am. And I'm responsible for what I preach from the word of God. But you know what? The Bible says every man will give account. Every man. So this is the way that I want to think about how I'm living, how I'm dressing, how I'm acting. Is you know what? I'm going to give account for how I'm living. And if the Bible says it, then it doesn't matter what I think about it. Then that, that, that ought to just settle it in my book. So <clears throat> now we're going back to Ephesians 5 tonight. And I, I, want, to, I want to just touch on this because... Um, I, I had a, a couple of people that texted me afterwards that said, you know, we, we, we would like to hear a little more about this. So this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to go into Ephesians 5, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit different than I did Sunday night, but I'm not going to stay here long. Um, a wife's a scripture would teach us is to defer to her husband as the authority. But I want, I want to explain what all that means, okay? Because her submission to him and their submission to God should be in divine harmony. Okay, this is not a dictatorship. I thought I'd had a few more women say amen right there. But anyway, this, of course, is the Christian ideal that makes marriage have the greatest, most lasting impact on its children and the extended family. But I'm going to tell you, uh, there, there's a question that was asked, and, and, and it, it comes from, and it, this, is, this person is not in that situation, obviously, but they said, when, if ever, is it proper for a wife to refuse to concede to her husband? As a pastor's son and now a pastor, I have seen many husbands, both within and without the Christian ranks, to whom it's extremely difficult for their wives to submit properly. Through selfishness, through immaturity, through arrogance, uh, their wives are little more than servants meant to answer their little every beck and call. And to these men, wives are little more than possessions. Not long after pastoring, I was at, uh, was at a ministry, it was at a general conference actually, and I, I had ran into a friend of mine. He's not a pastor, he's not a preacher. He was just a, a layman in the church, and he was at general conference. He wasn't in, in this state even, so uh, it was just a friend that I had made through quizzing. And, and um, I didn't even know he was, he was married uh, comes walking up to me holding hands and I figured it might have been a girlfriend something like that I mean he's still pretty young but apparently they were married and uh, he comes up to me and it wasn't long brother white into the conversation I realized this couple this this guy right here he's a ticking time bomb he's about to go off he is at his wits end he was in school for an advanced degree while she worked two full-time jobs 
The more I found out, she worked as a technician, but then she also was a mother to two small children. So I say two full-time jobs, you know. That's a full-time job in itself. So his studies, again, as he's talking to me, I begin to gather this information. His studies left him very little time for really any kind of employment that made money whatsoever. And so basically she's the primary breadwinner of the family. And, and so to make matters worse, when he arrived home daily from school, now he did go to school 8 in the morning. It was about 3 or 4 in the afternoon at least when he would get home. And, and so when he would get home from school, his expectations were both of his children uh, to be uh, there and his home to be quiet so he could sit in his easy chair and he wanted the house to be clean and he wanted it to be perfect just as his mother kept home. And then he said this in the biggest whining tone I've ever heard in my life, Brother John. He said, it isn't too much to ask that a wife has her husband a meal ready when he gets home, is it? Brother White, that is the most awkward place I've ever been in my life. He's standing there holding hands with the woman that he is degrading. And before I had the chance to respond, I mean, I'm standing there going, what in the world am I going to say? He didn't give me a chance. Again, it made it a hundred times worse. She's standing there. Before I had a chance to say anything, he proceeds to even go further and criticize her lack of intimacy and an unkept appearance. Now I'm going to tell you, you're not going to look the best when you got two kids with you. The baby's going to puke on your jacket. They're going to pull your hair. They're going to do everything possible to make you look like you really wasn't ready for church when you left the house, you know. And uh, that stuff just happens. He described, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm trying to get away. I'm by myself. I'm, my wife is in the in the main conference hall and they're having church and I had just stepped out to use the restroom. I thought, man, I, I wish I hadn't even come out of here now. And so I was trying to get back in there and, and uh, I about just walked straight to the altar when I got back in there. I was feeling horrible, I'm telling you. He described her as pathetic in how that she was trying to be romantic and then made fun. She, she wasn't a bad looking girl. He made fun of her looks and he couldn't understand why she wasn't Miss American, Molly Maid, Mary Poppins and Wonder Woman all at the same time. I mean, it was just, it was horrible. Uh, what, what all he was saying. And as he went on and on, you know, I'm standing there just kind of looking at him, and I glance at her, I look at him, and I glance at her. And the whole time I could just see her facial expression changing, and her reaction was just, it was horrible. Like a flower just melting, wilting in that summer heat. It, it was just awful. And the scorching rant that he had had took all of her self-esteem and dignity in a matter of about ten minutes. And she's struggling with hopes and dreams now dashed by a husband that she didn't even no longer recognize. And at that moment, I believe she knew her marriage was over. Now later on, time would tell me a whole lot more about the story, Brother Charles. Her husband was comparing his modest, hardworking, apostolic, beautiful wife to a student in the classroom who had no children, no job, no responsibilities, but she was full of charm and sensuality. And in his messed up comparison, his wife didn't have anything. And his selfishness eventually tipped the scales in favor of his illicit partner and away from his loving companion and the mother of his two children. Many marital difficulties, much like Vashti's, were caused by husbands failing to recognize the basic needs of their wives. Ephesians 5, husbands, he said, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Husbands, we ought to be able to meet the needs of our wives like the Lord does the church. Just like we're down and the Lord comes through and he lifts us up. If you notice your wife's having a bad day, it's your job to be the encourager and to come through and put a smile on her face and lift her up. 
I know this is digging in deep, but I feel my help coming on, all right? Men, we got to protect our wives like the Lord does the church. There's not anything going to walk into my marriage and rip it apart because I'm watching for that kind of stuff. I'm going to make up in my mind, I'm going to protect what is valuable to me. Brother Sam Emery was preaching one time. I have to be careful not to listen to him too much. Just like I have to be careful not to read too much Jeff Arnold. He, he was talking. He said, the devil ain't going to march some chicken to my marriage and rip it apart because I'm not paying attention. He said, I must value what God placed in my life. I cannot settle for a substitute for what God brought into my life as his blessing. Men, please don't comment more on other ladies' attire than you do the dress of your own wife. If you're not careful, the devil's going to drive a wedge between you. Let's go to Mark 10. Jesus answered and said unto them, The hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. I'm not in Genesis, I'm in Mark. Mark 10 and 7 says this, For this cause shall a man leave his mother, father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. We, again, I know we looked at this Sunday, but I'm going to bring this out in a little different. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder, or let not man put asunder. Couples of Humboldt UPC, please listen to Pastor tonight. Don't let the devil turn you against each other. Because God put you together. Don't let a man or a woman tear you apart. Make up in your mind, we're going to conquer the enemy together. Praise God. No authority in the world should compel a woman to act in a manner less than virtuous. While God has appointed the husband to be the head of the wife, let me just say this. His authority is not absolute. What do you mean by that? There is a higher law than that of a husband or a king. So it is the unwavering sense that a woman possesses to preserve her integrity and her self-respect. Vashti acted in accordance to the inward virtue she possessed. She was not trying to be rebellious, folks. She was actually honoring the king within. She could not follow through with the king's request because she was going to be sacrificing her virtue. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't let anyone talk you into a situation where you have to compromise your values. But settle the issue here and now. I've got a made up mind. Holiness is still right. This way of living is the best way of living. And I'm not looking for satisfaction elsewhere because I'm happy with Jesus. Amen. You see, Christianity, and, and when I say, when, okay, when is the right time for a woman not to submit to her husband? If he is asking you to go against the word of God, <clears throat> that's the short, sweet answer. If he's asking you to go against the word of God. And where this gets interesting, it's the nice way to put it, gets a little hairy sometimes that when the husband is not in church or the wife is not in church, that adds a whole other dimension. That's why we tell our young people, don't date somebody out of church. Because when you date them, eventually you're going to start having feelings for them. And you're going to end up wanting to marry somebody out of church. So that's why. Have we seen success where somebody has done it and got, it, got their spouse in church? Yes. But that is not the norm. That is the exception. And so we set guardrails. We set uh, guidelines and say, okay, don't don't do that. If if it's if, if you can save yourself a whole lot of trouble and, and a lot of struggle in your marriage, but you know what? Here's the thing: a lot of people think about this submission thing as being a degradation kind of thing for the woman. I want to tell you, Christianity has done a whole lot to elevate women, a whole lot more than any other religion. You study the Muslims, you study the Buddhists, you study all this kind of stuff. Women were prior to Christ coming viewed as little more than domestic slaves. The patriarch in the Roman Empire was the sole sovereign of his home and he had the authority to order the death of his wife and children. And you find in heathen religions the women who labored under the title of priestesses were little more than just temple prostitutes designed to allure men into the worship of idols. And so Jesus, he comes along and he says, I want to show you there's some great value that are here in the lives of women. Mary and Martha were two of his greatest friends. Christ's deity and resurrection appearance were both revealed first to women. Women were excluded from much of the Old Testament religious observances. But when Christ came, they found the ability to participate actively within the church. And so through the years, women have 
being great advocates of Christianity. I'm thankful it's no longer this way today, but years ago when you walked into an apostolic church, the majority of the congregation was women. The men didn't see the importance of going to church. Had a prayer meeting, it was all women showed up. But thankfully, the tide is changing and the church looks a lot better today because it's full families that are in the house of God. And so, uh, I, I, what made Vashti a true queen? And I, I'm almost done today. It wasn't merely that Ahasuerus the king had chosen her as his wife. That's why I read in the opening part and kind of telling the story, when she took the ribbon off, she felt just as much a queen then as she did at any time. Because marrying the king is not really what made her a queen. Her very nature... I believe, proclaimed her queenliness. Whether she wore the robes of royalty or the sackcloth of a peasant, she was not a queen by a mere external decree, but rather by her inward virtue. Her modesty, as well as that of the other women, is the noble diadem, if you will, that identifies a true queen. <clears throat> I preached a message about, Deborah, it's time to do your dance, and I referenced the queen bee in that message, and how that the queen bee is the life of a hive. She's not conceived a queen, but while she's in the larval stage, worker bees fashioned her into a queen by feeding her the sweetest of nectars. And such nurturing is rewarded in that result, uh, the, the resultant queen bee that will someday sustain the hive. And I say that to say this in much the same way a woman's virtue is formed within her by the sweet nectar of a sensitivity to God and the tender influences of parents, teachers, and peers. And so we believe God crowns a woman with virtue. Um, I believe that inside of every human being is virtue. As holiness is God's crown, so virtue graces uh, mankind. And so we are crowned with holiness. Uh, and, and we talk about even the women having virtue uh, and power upon their head. We talk about uh, in Proverbs 12, I believe it's verse number 4. Did I give you that, Brother Andrew? I don't know if I did. I did. Okay, a virtuous woman, he says, is a crown to her husband. All right? He says, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. In other words, you are going to make your husband a success or a failure. So that tells me the woman's not the weaker vessel spiritually. We don't believe in that. Now, we may, we may say there's certain things that it's harder for a woman to do in the physical than it is a man. That, that's just natural. That's not saying a woman can't do a man's job because sadly today there's a lot of women that are having to do it. But what I'm saying is that we don't need to degrade the worth of women in our houses and we need to understand that there is an importance here that they crown their husband. And so when I realize that's my crown, as a husband, I'm going to understand the value that's there. And I'm going to protect that value. See, she is worth more than the world's jewels because she instills trust and goodness in her families. Ladies, your long hair, your modest apparel, your humble spirit. I'm going to tell you, this world can't put a value on it. That's why these worldly men want our godly women. Hello? That's why these worldly men want our godly women. It's very rarely the other way around. I'm just trying to encourage us tonight. Your home is blessed when you live holy. This is men and women alike. Your home is exalted because you've humbled yourself before God. Vashti was no less a queen after her divorce. She was crowned inwardly with virtue. And that was worth more to her than retaining an earthly crown. Can I say this today? If we must act immodestly to win, I don't want to win. Because if I must act immodestly to win, then I have lost something far more than what I'll ever gain. I must understand my virtue is on trial. So I close with this. Brother Cannon, come back to music tonight. It's 820. Had Vashti been less than virtuous, we probably would not have the book of Esther in our Bible. Her great refusal assured her name and assured her a place in history. And so while many will overlook her great act and they quickly read through the first ten pages but enjoy the rest of Esther, you know. I tonight ask you to pause and be assured that it's her courage and her convictions that gave us Esther. Indeed, yes, what she did went beyond the ages and reached into the hearts of all Virtuous people as an example to chart an unwavering life. It's not a pretty ending. 
There's no birds chirping. There's no choir singing. No sweet notes coming from violins as Vashti walks across the grassy meadows. <coughs> no. She walks into the sunset alone. Deserted by her friends. There was no never, never land where her troubles melted like lemon drops and above the chimney tops. You know what? We may have to live with mountains that will not move sometimes. But we can face the inevitable and realize that we've got greater reserves and resources than we ever understood. When you stand for what is right, you'll find you had a strength that you really didn't realize you had. Vashti knew that. And as she left the palace, I have to believe Brother Edward echoing quietly through the Persian Empire was a, a steady rhythmic sound of somebody clapping. I've used this illustration before in talking about those that did what they needed to do. I believe he acknowledges every time somebody stands for godliness, even in this present world. Resounding through eternity, he cheers because he knows full well what it's like to endure an unjust trial handed out by those that he loved. I told you Sunday, Sunday that the scripture that helped me get through a very rough week last week was he was wounded in the in the house of his friends, but it said he was he had the wounds in where? His hands. So I have to believe with her back to the palace, Vashti steps into a world where she would anonymously try to build a new life. And crowned with virtue, she was sure to make it. For every step that she would take from the palace, I can hear a soft applause of two nail-scarred hands that would say, what you did was right. You know, the Bible says that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a reward time. And there's going to be crowns that are going to be handed out. And there's going to be rewards that are given to those that did what was right here. Not every time is somebody going to come up to you and say, well, Brother Amos, you did what was good. You keep trucking on. No, you don't always get that. But your assurance should come from the Word of God that says, you know what? If I live my life by that book, if the only reward I get, let's just say I get to heaven and Jesus don't bring me a crown. Everything else is going to be worth it. Not having to go to hell for eternity ought to be enough. Look in the eyes of the Savior. Straight into the eyes of the Savior. That ought to be enough. The things that I have to endure down here are not going to seem like a big deal when I get up there. The way that I had to dress and the way I had to act and the way I had to live that God called me to be, that's not going to be a big deal when I get there and I receive my new robe and I get to walk in my glorified body and I get to partake of the, the, the Lamb's the, the, the feast that's going to take place and, and I see that my name is in the Lamb's book of life when I get to do all of those things this stuff right here that, that our virtue and the things that we're trying to protect and our families and, and, and not giving in to temptation all of those things are going to seem minimal if we even think of them at all because of the splendor that awaits us in heaven would you stand with me today I, I believe God I don't want to say I believe. I know God desires us to live holy lives. Because he said, be ye holy, even as I also am holy. And you know what, folks? We do ourselves an injustice if all that we think is holy is what we show on the outside. God, help my spirit to be holy. I want my motives to be right. You can do the right thing with the wrong motive. I'm not going to go down that path. I can get myself in trouble. But you can do the right thing with the wrong motive. And I'm going to tell you, friend, you're just as wrong as the person doing the wrong thing. God, help us to maintain. I think this is why David would say, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Because I want to be right with God. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you.